is this green line, which is being built, Somerville, Medford. It was originally planned to go out to Woburn. The red line is going to go all the way to Arlington, and that's just, just touching the edge of Bedford. The Riverside green line was indeed built, but it was also going to go out to Needham, and it's going to be a loop back down with the commuter rail line. And the blue line was supposed to come to Lynn, where I live, and I'm very disappointed that it never did. So it's just it's just fine. I'll, I can put this online somewhere where people can get it. But anyway, I cut off Jeff. Who's about to make it up? Right. So um, I'd like to welcome everyone to the um, October ABCD GIS presentation. Um, today we are uh, pleased to have Stefan Gunch. Did I yeah. pronounce that correctly? Say Gunch. Yeah. Gunch. But, okay. <laughs> um, Stefan has been um, an IT developer with Harvard for about 18 years. Currently, he's with uh, the Cloud Computing Group, um, and he's on the advisory board for the MBTA as well. That's separate, actually. The, the advisory board is more is more formal. I'm on the Writer Oversight Committee, Writer which Oversight is a volunteer group of people. That average writers, there's 15 of us. Oh, there's 15 seats. We have some vacancies. Um, we just we act as uh, essentially a, a bridge between the writers and the agency. And so with that, I'll, I'll turn it to you because everyone's really excited to see what you've done with uh, this, these real-time maps and the MPTA data. So thank you very much. I'm really thrilled to be able to share this. Um, this all started um, for me as just something for fun, entirely just to see what I could do with the data just to amuse myself on nights and weekends. And uh, several years later of many nights and weekends with my wife that's a bit uh, regretful that I've chosen to do. Um, these are the fruit of all my all my labors. Uh, commuter Rail is probably the most popular. It's also the most mature of the two apps that I've written. The Subway is a little immature because it's a different data format, which I'll tell you all about. But I'm working actively, whenever I have spare time, to uh, put more features in and develop these further. Um, probably I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to aim to go maybe only about 30 minutes with the formal part and then leave lots of time for Q&A and get everybody out of here well before 1 o'clock. I want to run over. Um, so essentially, this is what I want to talk about. I'm willing to take questions as we go, or I'll maybe there's a couple points where I can actually break and like pause and let you <laughs> inhale and take a breath. I'm, I, I tend to be a, a fire hose information, so if drinking from a fire hose gets to be a bit much, you can tell me to Take a breath, let you just pause for a moment. Um, show of hands, MBTA riders in general. I figured, yep, uh, yep, right. So um, bus riders, I'm just curious. Oh, wow, and subway riders, wow, and commuter rail riders. I'm impressed, yeah, I ride a bit of each myself. Um, so I suppose there's probably a lot of people that can relate to um, that. <laughs> um, the answer for a long time was this. And it pretty much still is the case. I mean, that's the answer that the T has for almost everything they want to do. But when it came to presenting the writer with options and presenting the, the writer with what's happening now, they realize we, we already have stuff that we can share. So way back in 1919, um, 2009, they started, not going to go this whole presentation, it's not mine, it's from MassDoc, but um, in the fall of 2009, they had a developer conference to kick things off, and they made a big publicity uh, 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 burst. And they were very proud to say that. Again, I'm just going to blow through this. I want to get to one point. Yep. Um, 200 plus people in November of 2009 were at the the hackathon, and uh, I talked to the, the two guys who ran this. They said that um, throughout all of the, the rollout of the live data, et cetera, the most money they spent on any one thing was the pizzas for the event. <laughs> um, by the time they got going, this is what I want to show you. Okay, so after they kicked off the hackathon, again, this is the fall of 2009, in one hour, somebody had pulled up and whipped up this. In one day, 
full blown matchup in a week. A, a specialized widget. I don't know if you remember dashboard widgets. They're a little bit deprecated now on on Macs, but it only took somebody a week to do that. Two weeks there was full blown predictions, and this is my favorite. Somebody whips up a hardware device. So that's that's an illustration of the enthusiasm that the developer community uh, and you know writers have had for the data being available in the first place. Six years later, 82 apps. If you're not familiar with this page, definitely it's it's a very easy thing to remember. mbk.com slash apps. I'm just gonna scroll down. Look at all of the options. There's virtually every mobile platform. There's web. There's things that are bus only, subway only, combinations of things. There's apps that will wake you up if you are coming up close to your stop on the commuter rail because it knows where you are from the GPS location on your phone. Astounding. And the MBTA and MassDot, all they had to do was put out the data for it. And all the work was done by third parties. So me, I'm a geek. I like to think of myself as a geek who can actually communicate and present. Hopefully, you'll agree by the end of this. Um, this is my first time doing anything of this scale. It's certainly the first time I've done anything for general consumption by anyone outside of me and maybe a small uh, department in Harvard. Because I'm, I'm, you know, I, I do occasional development, but I'm not a professional author. I'm a map geek. I love maps. I, some of the stuff I was showing you before I started, just the tip of the iceberg, I've probably got hundreds of maps of various ages and you know, transit things, like that you know, projection that I showed you, what was never built. I love stuff like that. Um, and I, I was convinced that this data being out there meant that something useful could be done in a way that nobody had before. So just a quick timeline of it. Way back, 2008, there was nothing. I mean, there was, okay, T alerts, it was a good start. You know, it's still pretty decent, but the real, the, the, the momentum really got going around, I think around 2010 and then 2011 when the commuter rail hit and the subway. Oh, by the way, for the, the purposes of, uh, the, the nomenclature gets a little bit weird, but heavy rail is defined as the, um, like, rapid transit. Like, the orange, blue, and red lines are considered heavy rail rapid transit. The green line, because it's street running on the B, C, and D, and all, all four of the lines in some, in some parts, um, that's considered light rail. And, of course, commuter rail is entirely separate. That's a railroad as opposed to just, you know, transit rail. Um, okay. Shout out to Dave Barker. The Deputy Director of Operations Technology is um, absolutely reachable. You can email developer at mbta.com with questions, and they get back to you like in in hours and time. Um, that he supplied the access <laughs> to me. The um, quick, quick question. Yeah, of course. About I live on the Green Line, and are you saying that the Green Line train data is only available as of this year? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I've, been looking, I've been looking for apps for a while. I'm like, oh. The very yeah. the, 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 and his stuff has a yep. the, info the very first, the very okay. first rollout of Greenline was October 2014, and um, without blowing my horn, my, own, my own horn too much, but I'm a little bit proud that I was one of three third-party developers, independent app developers, who was invited by the T, myself and two other uh, two other organizations, to present at the the rollout for you know the big press event. The, uh, the Secretary of Transportation, uh, sorry, so, so the CTO of MassDOT was there, all the MBTA staff, and I was one of three people because um, my mapping app, I think, still has a, has a, has a niche. For what it's worth, the other two people are MBTA Info, and like <laughs> Andy and the guys who wrote uh, Proximity, the, 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 the iOS app that, um, I'll, I'll, I'll show you, I'll pull that up later on. But October 2014, literally one year ago, was the very first Green Line data. And for majority of the last, of the first six months, it was above ground only. Um, I'll talk about that in a second. The, um, the commuter rail was my primary means of getting to and from Lynn, so that was my original focus. Plus, it seemed like it was uh, a more wide-ranging system, I thought. 
you know, it's 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 all you know. It's kind of cool to have the the data for the subway, but I thought, well, commuter rail, you know, it's it's much more expansive of a system. Um, and bus, for what it's worth, buses. The bus data had been already put out in in form and and also in, a, in an app by the next bus company, which is the the contracted vendor that does all the aggregation for the T. So buses, I was like, eh, not really, not terrible, not too, not too interesting to me. Um, but after fits and starts, and after a lot of nights and weekends, this is what is up now and for public consumption. And by the way, you don't have to worry about trying to write down that link because you can simply go search Google for MBTA live map. And I'm very happy to say that my commuter rail one is the first and my subway one is the second. And this is what we now have. I pull up on a Google map, not only the base of where the routes are with purple and the stations, clickable for basic information, this is something that's on my to-do list to expand. I hope to eventually have a click on the station to tell you when the next train will be arriving. Uh, but for the moment, my app is very train-centric. The, the world sort of revolves around each train. Mouse over an icon will tell you where it is. Now arriving at East Weymouth, what the scheduled stop was, various information about it. If it's on the move, It'll tell you, hey, that train's going 42 miles an hour right now. If you double click on it, boom, bring you right in. This accuracy, I've found the GPS accuracy is within about 15, 20 feet. I mean, that's what you'd expect for GPS. You guys probably know more than I do. But generally, I believe it is the size of the antenna array um, relates to the accuracy. The, the antennas on the commuter rail trains are they're decent. You know, it's about a six inch, um, six inch dome. Um, pretty good. You can scroll around and again get information. My guiding principle was to make this more of a visualization tool than a daily transit tool, but I found so many people have either contacted me or just by word of mouth or by looking at the traffic to the website. People are using it as a daily commuter tool. Um, I personally don't even leave the house without looking saying where is my train. <laughs> I've gotten it down to the point where I don't even look at whether it's early or late. I just say, well, wait a minute. I don't know how long it takes me to walk from my house to the train station. I know how long it takes the train to go from somewhere up the line to my station. I just leave the house every day when the train gets to a certain point earlier on the trip. I don't, early, late, whatever. I know if the train is at a certain point, I start walking, I'll meet it, and invariably, like every single day of the week, I'm just coming on the station, on the platform, the train pulls in. That's how people live in Switzerland, except it's actually yeah, on the it's on <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. Well, you know, for a, a quick view of what's happening right now, I also pulled in a table view. And we can see, well, at this moment, there's only one train. No, oh, there's, sorry, there's two. Three, okay, three trains are late by a little bit. Um, oh, and I, I, actually, I should, I should point out a little bit more. I put this table view in, again, as part of a visualization. You know, the, the map is obviously the core of my, of my application, but the data itself is so interesting that you know, when there's serious issues, when there's faults on a particular line, often you get a better picture of what's happening and where if you can pull it up and sort on the time, the locations, the lines, uh, so again, this is a dynamic table. Uh, I wasn't I wasn't planning on going into any detail on how I generate this, but I can if if there's interest until later on. Um, again, the focus on the the focus on the experience for my app is all about the map. Um, for areas where there's too many trains in one spot, I came up with well not came up with but I discovered a Google library for the Maps API that allows you. <coughs> to cluster them, they call this a marker clusterer. So there's two here, there's three here, they're too close together to reasonably show them. If you want to, I built in a mechanism where you can hit shift and it will pop up cool. outside of the cluster. But if you do want to drill in, click, and there's those three trains. They all have no speed reported because they're in the station, but you still get information about what the, uh, oh, one just disappeared. It's probably just, yeah. Um, now I'll, I'll 
I'll, I'll clue you into a little bit of a secret for you commuter rail folks. If you're boarding at North Station or South Station, you have an added bonus. Um, I don't know how many other apps actually show you what the vehicle number is. For example, this train is 1651 on the control coach end. It just so happens that the MBTA puts their GPS here, and they call it the PTIS system, the Passenger Train Information System. Very grandiose term. It basically just means that's the system that makes the automated announcements, now departing, now we're now arriving, that's the onboard computer voice. The PTIS, which includes the GPS receiver, is mounted in the control car, which is at the opposite end of the train from the locomotive. The control car was a really great choice for an application like mine and used by us commuters because, for example, the control car is always facing in to the station. At North Station and South Station, the locomotives are always on the other end because they want to keep all the smoke out of the station. So because the T decided to put the GPS units in the opposite end from the locomotive, it means they're always facing towards you when you're standing at the platform. So even before they announce the train, there's usually a 90% chance that the PTIS gear will be logged in and telling you that that, oh, there we go, just headed out. Um, so whoever was waiting for this train before it started boarding could have just walked up and down the platforms and said, well, where is 1651? Oh, I'll stand near this train, or maybe even I'll walk out on the platform, which you're not supposed to do, but you can do it and it's very neat. I'll get a better seat potentially because I know that that vehicle number is within about a 90% chance going to be my train. So it can give you a little edge on the getting a better seat for your trip for your ride. I do that all the time. Um, but oh, as I should mention also, the data feed is uh, just, it's the position and, and train information is only one part of it. There's also, and I'll, I'll get into more detail, with more detail, there's also the departure board. So this data feed that's feeding the departure, my departure um, part of the app, is literally what's on the big LED boards at North Station and South Station. And when they announce a track, boom. And they also include, very often, they'll include whether it's early or early. <laughs> never, <laughs> just, never <laughs> departs, <laughs> no, actually, they're, they're trains, um, very, very often express trains that are like coming in from, let's say, uh, making an express run from like 128 to Back Bay, you know, skipping Ruggles and um, skipping Forest Hills. They can often be early because they're running express. So it is actually possible, and I, I included that on my uh, in my map. Um, so besides the speed, you also get uh, if you if you watch during rush hour, very often you'll see the additional color pop up. This this legend is dynamic. It'll only show you what's relevant to what's on the map at the moment. I color the uh, the early ones in red. It does show up every now and then. Um, I say I'm getting ahead of myself from uh, where I wanted to be. So that's the, just the uh, the little bit of the view. I'll, I'll talk more about how um, how it works, but I think a lot of you also want to know about what's on the back side. Google Maps has a lot of different ways to present things. I think the most web friendly is the JavaScript API. Um, I found that in order to make best use of the data and be able to consume it the best on the web browser, whether it's a mobile device or a regular desktop laptop, I had to do a lot of pre-processing of it. A lot of it came out of the fact that the original setup was comma-separated values for the, the best data. Um, that's changed, but <laughs> pre-processing it allows me to do a lot of uh, a lot of extra work and add some value. Um, I'm, I'm I'll skip past the, uh, the, the details. If, if you're not familiar with um, AJAX, it's essentially the um, asynchronous mechanism for being able to have additional data retrieved from a source on the fly. And uh, jQuery, table sorter, and these libraries are uh, bolt-ons to, uh, my mouse isn't showing up on here, but at this point. The um, jQuery is probably the most popular uh, web uh, JavaScript framework for doing um, app development, and the table sorter is what I used for displaying that HTML table, that dynamic table I showed you, and the location markers, the, they're just different components that go into making it a uh, more rich uh, map experience. A um, bit about the data, the red, blue, and orange lines are 
a bit better at providing data that's accurate for a position, which is good for, it's important for a mapping application, than the green line. Because the, well, let's just say with the green line underground, because the red, blue, and orange lines have track circuits that control the signals. So if a train is in a certain location, the signal system will split so the train behind that knows that there's a train where, where it is, so there's not going to be any rear end collisions or anything like that. But the, um, the Green Line system has blocks that are able to accommodate, in many cases, more than one train. I'll talk more about that in a second. The, um, the Green Line is very interesting because there's a legacy system of underground signals, you know, block signals, that um, goes back 75, 80 years, which is part of the reason why the Green Line data came online the latest, because their system of signaling is the oldest. But also, when you're above ground, the Green Line has to rely on GPS because there are no block signals. When you're above ground, the Green Line is operating entirely, with the exception of some parts of the, the D-Line uh, Riverside branch, it's almost entirely line of sight or just like you know, for traffic signals. There's nothing that tells the MBTA even um, before the system came out where, where the trains are. In fact, if you ever sit on the Green Line up front near the operator's uh, yes. booth, yeah, you can say, oh, 3841, where are you? Have you passed Riverside? Or have you passed uh, Cleveland? Well, yeah. they, they literally, up until the system rolled out, the T themselves didn't know where the Green Line cars were from one minute to the next. Uh, I'm not going to talk much about the buses other than to say that the buses are kind of cool, that not only do they have GPS, they have a dead reckoning system where the, um, the distance traveled um, from the, uh, the, the system odometer is fed into the, uh, they call it a transit master system. So even if they're in downtown and there's skyscrapers obscuring the GPS signal, or they're in the tunnel like the Silver Line Way or the Harbor Tunnel, there's still um, a very, very high degree of accuracy for the position because of that dead reckoning. I don't know if that's a standard thing for a transit master. It probably is, and probably other agencies use it, but it's definitely unique for the, um, the MBTA. And I already mentioned the commuter rail has uh, GPS receivers and, and control the things. <coughs> The, uh, the data for the subway is great. It's really about every 10, maybe 15 seconds, it'll, it'll refresh. So you get a, when, you're, when you're watching the map view, my, in particular my, my app view of the subway system, it's a ballet. I mean, you're seeing things moving almost constantly. The commuter rail data, unfortunately, I, I, I don't know. I've asked, and they don't really want to say, well, where's the, you know, where's the fault lie? I don't know if it's because the technology is in the trains or whether it's their system of aggregation, or whether it has to do with the fact that the commuter rail data is transmitted back to the mothership over the same Wi-Fi cellular system that the customers can use. You know, so when you're on board the commuter rail and you can pull up and connect to the Wi-Fi, you know, commuter coach one, two, three, up in the control car, that's the same Wi-Fi, the same connection via a cellular signal that the data is going over. So that may add to the latency. 90 seconds is pretty rough. And then when does that get updated <clears throat> towards your website? I'm pulling it every, I'm pulling the MBTA, um, depending on whether you're on a mobile app or you're on a regular uh, desktop laptop, uh, pretty aggressively. I think I'm pulling for mobile devices about every 15, 20 seconds, and for a desktop laptop about every 12 seconds. Okay. Um, the MBTA says that they want you to only pull um, as, as with a, a minimum of, of 10 seconds because that's, that's, they don't want you to be hammering their server all the time. So I said, okay, well, they want 10, I'll go for 12. Do I, uh, on the front end, you're using jQuery, but on the back end, what database and language are you using? I'm actually not using a database at all. Um, I'm essentially just <coughs> uh, slurping in what the T has, has in their data feed doing a little bit of pre-processing and then spinning it out. With the one exception being, um, actually, I'll, and I'll talk about this in a second, I'm doing a little bit of caching where, it, because I don't want to hit the MBTA servers any more than about every 12 seconds just to be nice, um, plus I wanted to be able to uh, pre-process and, and be able to manipulate. I'm actually downloading a copy onto the server where, where, where all the data is hosting, manipulating it, and then I'm spinning it out. So I'm, so it's kind of, Kind of a shame that the T has no visibility into how many people are using my app because my apps are hitting the Harvard server where it's hosted, 
And then it's only talking to the T once every 12 seconds for a data feed. So they, they think it's just one person using their data feeds, and that one person is doing it every 12 seconds, 24 hours a day. But in reality, I could have, I don't, I'm not even sure how many people use my apps. But that, that caching has helped a great deal. Of load so when you're downloading the data, you're, you're putting it into a file. You're downloading yep. the file. It's just a file on disk, and then. So that's the persistence. Yep, exactly. Yeah. So I can't really call it a database. I mean, yeah, yeah. the more mature way, and I'll, I'll mention this in, in, in a little bit, the um, uh, GTFS data is really more for feeding it into a database. And then, I mean, but that's a little bit beyond my abilities at the moment. But I'll, I'll come back to that. So um, this stuff doesn't come in as GTFS? There are multiple options. Okay. Um, there's the, the, there's the, the, the API that you can make for queries to get back JSON. And there's also the entirely separate bus feed, which is a proprietary next bus system. But then they also have GTFS real time. Um, GTFS is something I haven't really touched because it's, it's, a, it's a protocol buffer format. It's essentially a big binary blog of highly compressed, highly, um, uh, I'll just say compressed data. Um, so in order to extract that and, and use it, you really have to have a database to be able to feed it in so then you can query out of it. But GTFS is what the T recommends for doing real time if you want to show everything. They recommend that because you can just make one web query for the current GTFS real time blob and you'll get every vehicle in the entire system. It's a lot more work to process it after that. So I've stuck with the, the JavaScript um, API, sorry, the JSON calls, or I'm still for the commit rail, I'm still using the comma separated values file because it's there are some issues that I found with the data quality on the on the new API. Um, oh yeah, just to mention here, this what I talked about before about the signal blocks. Um, I've never seen, uh, as far as I remember, a red, blue, and orange line um, situation where the there's multiple trains showing up with exactly the same location. It's because the signal blocks enforce it. But with the green line, because underground there can be more than one train, say in Park Street Station. There can be more than one train inside a, 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 the, the, the size of a signal block because a lot of it is, is line of sight. A lot of times you'll see on the map what appears to be a, a two or three green line trains on the exact same spot on the map. It makes it annoying because then you can't really view the, um, the markers if you can't mouse over it and get a pop-up with that information because they're on exactly the same spot on the map. I haven't really worked out a way. I, I don't want to be trying to. I don't want to be fudging the GPS values just for display purposes. I want to try to keep the data native. Whatever the T sends out, I want to display it. But in that case with the green line, if they're really on the same GPS spot, I may have to play with it. Um, this was the original. I think you could justify that as a form of cartographic generalization. Yeah. It's actually required for usability, and yeah. it doesn't have anything to do with the problems of the data. Good point. I appreciate that support. Um, this was the original commuter rail feed, the comma separated values. Um, I won't go into a lot of detail on this because it's, it's deprecated. They, they've been very good about saying um, on their page it's still up. This data is deprecated. It's still here. Um, they did come up with a better JSON format. I don't know if you're familiar with JSON, but uh, JSON is essentially all key value pairs. Timestamp is this, trip is this, trip is this. When they first came out with the JSON, it was almost a little bit unusable because they had uh, key values where the, the key would say key, and then it would say the, the value of the key would be timestamp. And then they'd have a key name that said value. And I mean, it was completely insane. Like, they'd have a key name key. It, yeah, anyway, they've, done, they've improved it. But this is, again, deprecated in comparison to. So, Stefan, yeah. that comes out still with CSV? It is. That's still what I use. Um, there's 12 different CSV files. I read them all in, line by line, special sauce. Oh, and I, I should show you. But this is pretty basic information. You know, there's really not a lot going on here. You get the basics, time, light of laundry, attitude. I, I wanted to cut down on the, the client-side processing. So I came up with my own JSON structure, lots of extra goodies, I'm computing what the schedule is for the particular day of the week. I'm adding in the info window. When you mouse over, it's displaying something that was generated on the server side. So the client doesn't have to do that extra processing. 
all the color coding I'm doing on the server side, speed colors. So that cuts down on the on the client uh, computing requirements a lot. Uh, again, same thing with the departures board feed. It's also CSV, but I manipulated and get um, particularly. I'm, I'm I'm happy with uh, having these arrays up at, at the beginning trips with track status. It makes it really easy to scan through and say, oh, I don't have to worry about um, alerting somebody who's viewing it to all the other trips that don't have a track. They're, they're not boarding yet. They're, there's no track listed for these. So I'm gonna skip over these. I'll just focus on with my app, 159, 77, 807. Those are the only ones that I would have to focus on. Again, that's all server-side processing. Um, the current generation for commuter rail and subway, it's great. JSON, yay, but as I say, JSON, yay, uh, JSON, I don't know. Whereas I could write my own schema for JSON for the, from the CSV, now I would have to read in all the JSON. I mean, it's still theoretically the same amount of manipulation, but the whole idea with the, the JSON output that the T produced was that it would be consumed directly by the client. You wouldn't have to do any kind of pre-processing or what have you. Your web browser would talk directly to the T's servers. Hey, I'd love that. I wouldn't. I'd love to not have to do caching and pre-processing, but it still isn't the kind of information that I want. I still want to do some pre-processing. So, like, oh yeah, and the other con is the developer key is essentially what um, the T uses to track usage. You know, so you you write to the T and say, hey, I'm I'm building this app. Please get me a developer key. You know, they give you like a 64 character alphanumeric string. That's your your identifier, basically. Uh, that has to be on the side of whoever's. Not a big deal, but you know, having <clears throat> my developer key out on the browser seems a bit weird. I'd rather have the, 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 my developer key on my server or you know the hardware server. I say not my server, but where I'm doing the the pre-processing. So again, you know, pros and cons to where you do it all. Subway, same thing. One nice thing about the, is they call it the API v2 because the, the first generation API was pretty bad and they deprecated that pretty quickly. Um, it's the same thing, for the same quick, no matter what you want to get. Red, green, blue, orange, commuter rail, you just vary your, your, your query parameter. Just say, oh, I want this line, I want the province line, boom. I want the red line, boom. Nice and easy, one interface. Oh, and really good documentation. <laughs> Realtime.mbta.com is the starting point. If you're going to write down uh, another URL, that's one to start off with. Realtime.mbta.com not only is their site for registering your app, getting a key, this is a documentation source, and some of the docs are really excellent. The V2 quick start, does pull this up really quick. About the open data, quick tour of the API. They give you an example with a clickable link right here. <clears throat> Highlights in the PDF, examples, click the link, and bam, that's live right now data. They have an open use API key. That's an example of what the API key looks like. Every developer should get their own. Um, but they have one for public consumption. So again, you know, kudos to them for doing a great job. They've got two different query examples. It's all just HTTP. And, oh, yes, before I uh, get this. A JSON viewer is just a wonderful thing. Um, you saw how the JSON that you get, when I'm <coughs> displaying it here, it's all nicely formatted. You've got your arrays, you've got um, associative arrays, all nicely structured. That's the JSON plugin doing it in my browser. If you don't have one of these JSON viewers, yeah. yeah, it's basically just text. Pretty much impossible to, to, to decipher. The JSON viewers just make it a, a, a wonderful thing. Um, one other quick thing to mention, the iOS simulator is fantastic. Bail out of here and switch over to. This is a full blown iOS implementation that you can run on your laptop. Let's search for live MBTA map. And 
Presto. Here is an iOS version of my app adjusted for the platform. It's a click instead of a mouse over. Oh, hey, it knows where our location is. We can zoom in. We can zoom in on where we are. Oh, that's right. I keep forgetting. In the simulator, it doesn't actually use your real location. You, you customize, you put in a specific GPS location, or you can put in a track for playback. So that's not where we really are right now. That's just something I, I, I put in. Um, but again, this is a fantastic tool if you're doing app development for a mobile platform because this is it's literally a copy of the same iOS that's on your phone. It's just packaged up in a way that works within the Mac OS. Is there an Android version? I'm not an Android developer. I, I believe there is. I think I've heard references to Android simulators, but I just I can't tell you about it. I'm, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, oh yeah, one one big downside: the App Store is not available on the simulator, so you can't go and download somebody else's app inside the simulator. You can only use the browser or your own app if you're developing it from, from source code. So they don't they don't want you to be using the simulator instead of a phone. Hey, they want to solve problems. Um, I mentioned the GTFS earlier. There's a lot of data out there about it. It's on my to-do list. Um, it seems to be a better solution that's a little more versatile, but I would have to have a lot more back end. I'd have to have a database. I'd probably have to read the database and then read it out again. Um, I want to get, I'll make these slides available through Jeff so that you, hopefully you're not scribbling down links because you'll be able to get this all. <laughs> is that an international standard or US? Or I believe it is, yeah. Um, I read the doc actually. It's used to be called the Google transit <laughs> feed specification, but uh, they have made it generalized. I don't remember if it's actually uh, supported as like an ISO or, or, or uh, kind of a, an RFC for it, but it's, it's pretty much the de facto for transit information. Yeah, just as a small side point, because yeah. I've been working with GGFS, it's built right. based off of stops as the backbone. So you put in, you know, stops one, three, seven of these GPS uh, coordinates, and then you make a route based off of this route goes to these stops, which doesn't work as well where I'm coming from, which is Amman, Jordan, where a lot of the world doesn't have fixed stops. You know, bus will stop anywhere. And so actually a big thing is it's huge in the transit world, and yet also very much has certain built-in assumptions about how a transit system works. <laughs> So it's just one of these interesting universal yet well, not. Well, developed it's trying to, so it's not surprising. That, that reminds me, um, just to note, <clears throat> I, I learned of an app, of, uh, of a site yesterday called Traffic. Mm -hmm. You ran across that? Okay. These guys are these guys are consuming every GTFS feed in the world, as far as I, I believe, that they, that they know about. It's like <clears throat> 250. All lives, so you can zoom into about 250 cities around the world and see the live wow. stuff moving. It's uh, traffic, cool. traffic. T R A V I C. It's called Traffic, T R A V I C. Yeah. And that's the benefit of using GTFS, is it's a standard. It's that all, yeah, it's just sucking in GTFS yeah. and making it available. And when every Google car on the road has a yeah. little GPS report right. in the end, you can literally have a lot of world traffic. I wasn't going to spend a lot of time yeah. on the details <coughs> of the, the Google Maps API unless there was interest. I mean, just, just suffice to say that the documentation is great with one simple line. This is all it takes to create a map in your browser. I mean, the, the HTML is not that much more. Do a little bit of CSS, and there's your function, and you load the Google Maps script, and that's it. So getting started with Google Maps API for JavaScript is great. It's, it's a wonderful set of tools, and it's such, they, they've advanced it so far. There's so many different um, libraries, add-ons. It's, it's just great. Um, in my case, I wanted to point out that one of the pain points, and I still haven't, I worked out a way, a way to handle this. Um, because JavaScript wants to be, and is typically asynchronous, you can have a particular function that can run without regard to any other call of that same function. So in several cases, I've had, um, say you're on a mobile device, you, you query the server to get the latest data, 
what if your network isn't quite there? Well, that query is still going to be outstanding from your your browser. The next iter the next cycle of like say twelve seconds later, your browser says, oh, "Okay, time's up, and I have to make another query." That one might go through you, so you get newer data that previous query still hasn't finished. Oh, now you're back on the network. Now that <coughs> succeeds, you might actually be getting data out of order. So now, I, I've seen it in a couple of cases on my phone uh, personally where a train will go forward and then go backwards and then go forward again because the asynchronous nature of JavaScript meant that there was a function call to get more data that then they got out of order because there were multiples. I haven't really worked out a way to handle that, but it's, well, it's, it's, it's just rare. Number the queries and say that one's a smaller number than the last one. Yeah, the, the, the catch is that the, what, once you fire off a function, they're sort of they're they're off on their own space. You really can't you really can't access them. You, you have to have a lot of global variables last, and state like, tracking. Yeah. Last query, yeah. last successful query was number twelve, and comes back and yeah. says. Yeah, it's finish. Just, finish. Said, no, it's that's actually a form of parallel processing. Yeah. Yeah. It's a no problem yeah. in yeah. parallel processing right. coding to manage okay. the serialization. There are techniques, okay. but okay. I, I will look at. I didn't. I didn't think of it in terms of parallel processing. That's great. Uh, oh yeah, the other, the other part is uh, about iterations. I mean, the, the most straightforward way for me to get started with doing all this was simply to iterate across every marker. So if I've got a hundred trains on the map and there's a new data point of location for each one. I need to iterate through all 100 updated on the map. I can probably come up with a way of saying, okay, the viewport of this map is only these trains. Let's just forget about the other ones. But I also want to have the experience be really um, responsive. If somebody is viewing a very small section and then they jump back out to the big, the big view, I want to have all those other markers already where they should be. So I don't want to, I don't want to try to sacrifice, you know. The, um, the the processing in for for just I, sorry I, I don't want to sacrifice the user experience of being up to date for cutting down on a bit of processing as hardware getting faster uh, again the just classic issues of trade offs of the amount of data that you need versus <clears throat> what are you updating the amount of processing versus how much you want to pull down the um, latency uh, I think most developers will pull, pull data when the user wants it. So if, if there's a um, if there's train information for a train that's entering hardware station and somebody mm -hmm. clicks on it, that will generate a query to get data about that train. There might be some round trip time there. I've done it so where that all the data is loaded in your browser. So you mouse over, like I was showing you before, you, you mouse over the uh, I'll come back to it later. But you, you mouse over one of the markers on the map, you get that <laughs> data instantly because it's all been pre populated. Again, pros and cons. Uh, the different marker types is also a challenge. I wanted to be able to have people customize for bigger text and just colors, have the direction icon. Each one of the marker types in the JavaScript API is entirely its own, um, its own object. You can't have a marker that is one type and another type. So if you want to have, say, the, 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 the direction arrow and the big text at the same time, you'd have to instantiate both of those kinds of markers. It means more memory. It means more updating. So I said, OK, you know what? The, the solution to that is I'm just going to have to destroy all the markers on the map and then recreate them all when somebody changes from one type of marker to the other. Um, I can actually tell. That's worth. That's worth showing. Mm -hmm. that. So if I'm, say I'm viewing. You can. There's also an option. You can turn off the clusters entirely. Sometimes you get better presentation. So if I'm viewing, all of these. This is the um, the marker type with the in the heading arrow. If I flip this to <laughs> This cycle the labels again. If I turn off the heading arrow, which is essentially changing the type of marker, again, I might put this down here, which I brought into the map, turn off that heading arrow, I've got to destroy everything and then recreate them with the other marker type. Same thing if I want to not show any text information, it's going to destroy everything and then recreate them. 
it's pretty quick. It's not a bad way of doing it. I mean, the, like I said, the, the alternative would be to have four times more markers on the map if I want to show, be able to have preloaded all four kinds. So I said, you know what, this is okay. And again, just you know, showing you, you can represent pretty much whatever you want. Text, no text, no arrow, just big colorful text. Um, there you go. <laughs> This actually has a pretty um, interesting side benefit. Because these markers are big and colorful, they actually show up on the Google Street View. So I haven't figured out a way to actually uh, to expand this. It may not be something that they support. But if you go into Street View, if you drag the little guy, say we're at North Station. Uh, it's hard to find a good example. but. Uh, we're getting short on time, I'll skip this. If you were to drag the little peg man and go into Google Street View and you were close enough to be within range of this train, you would see the this big colorful icon on the street view. Mm -hmm. And if you're standing at like, you know, at a at a, at a grade crossing, you'd see the marker go whizzing by you <laughs> in street view really? as the train goes by. It's really wild. Wow. That's wild. It is. How do you get to whiz by? You're only updating right. your reads. Not, not exactly. do I do animation. You extrapolate? I am. Oh, that's Pardon me while my app for presentation just quit. Go back in. There we go. Um, skip ahead here. Ah, I'll, come, I'll answer that question in a sec. Um, mobile device for JavaScript, really easy. You just search the user agent. It says iPhone or Android or whatever. Boom. Then you know that it's a mobile platform. All of my code, I'd say most of my code, checks out this variable mobile platform that I created. That's how I'm rendering the different uh, different user interface. Um, you want to know about the, the animations? I can ask you later. That's fine. No, no, it's fine. Um, this is actually a good, a good timing. So this is how I'm doing the animations. I'm no. I'm not serious. I mean, this is probably way too much of my actual code. I mean, I'm happy to talk to anybody offline. You can email me, but there's no way that we could reasonably cover in a, in a presentation some of the things that I'm doing. Um, but I can tell you that essentially the animations are me making a path between the previous point and the next point, sort of dividing it up into chunks to make it reasonable for processing, and then just jumping the marker along. So if the uh, Actually, this is good to show on the subway version. As I was saying before, the subway version is much more fluid, much more dynamic, because the data updates so much more often. By the time that I finish the sentence, I expect there will have been a data update. And there we go. There's things moving along. <coughs> There's right now 72 trains on this map right now. During rush hour, it can be over 100. On a mobile device, you get a little hokey, so I'm mean, gonna really have to do some optimization unless I just want to wait around for phones to get faster and faster and faster. Um, wrapping up, um, these are worth showing really quick. The reason, part of the reason I didn't do bus is because next bus really, really owns it, um, and I have to admit, I got a lot of inspiration from the next bus company. This is. Their Google Map real time. This particular view is all of the MBTA key bus routes. There's 15 key routes that the T has decided are worthy of more service. They call them the key routes. Um, the format for the next bus map is incredibly easy. You can pull this up. They do a mobile version as well. Next bus, Google Map, question mark, A for agency equals MBTA. And then you simply tag on. Ampersand R for root equals and whatever number. Somebody want to shout out a root number? Six. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> Just delete. It can do one or many. Eighty-six. Bam. There's the entire root and real time. So again, I got inspiration from Next Bus, but it's also why I didn't go into do it because they they own it. They they've got it. They they it's very mature in doing this for you. Um, Amtrak, I didn't realize, does a very good map implementation. 
looks a lot like mine. This came out very recently. They've got marker clusters, 30 trains in this area. Click on it. You zoom in. Click on a marker. Rich information. They've got color coding. They've got a north-south. They've got a compass rose, speed. I have to say, this is sort of the, uh, <laughs> this is to what I aspire to be. So, yeah, they're giving me a run for my money. But. Is that a Google? Is that using a Google map or open, open maps? It is Google. Google. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Updated by Google. They so, styled it differently. You can, yeah, you can do it. Is exactly. Yeah, it's, it's all about the styling. But I have to say, this is, um, Look bad. <laughs> is that developed in house? Right. Um, they don't really talk much about it. I, be I believe it is. Um, I really only found a press release about it saying Amtrak now has uh, you know, live tracking. That's pretty much it. Oh, this guy is really great for your daily commute. MBTA.meteor.com. Nice easy to remember. This is real time, and the coloring is based on a historical performance. Mm. The darker the green, the more close to historical <coughs> average the current trip time is. Sliding window historical, or? I'm not sure. sure. They don't have any content. Well, they, they've got a submit your email, mm. but there's nothing on this page about them, about what, how they do it. I mean, <laughs> there may be some source code that you can dump. I mean, it's pretty much a black box, but it's really great. I mean, so right here's a, here's a little bit of orange right here. Right here, Davis Dale Wife. Oh, and I've, oh, I've seen it. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen Oh, you should have seen it last winter. Yeah. Red, <laughs> black, yeah. or gray, not, nothing. I mean, there's a block where there's there's no trains in that. <laughs> Again, mbt.meter.com. Are you keeping any historic data? I do. Um, I save every two minutes the entire MBTA commuter rail system data, snapshot, every two minutes. And I've got that going back about two and a half, maybe three years now. It's actually surprisingly small. I mean, it's, all, it's all text. It compresses like mad. It's great. Um, I have not done any historical analysis. I, I would like to do something where, like, you know, fusion. Uh, uh, fusion tables, heat maps. To, here is a part of the commuter rail route that historically is slow and. Where's the variability? Where's exactly, all the play, all exactly. I have so many ideas and yeah. just right. not the skill set of the time. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, oh, and almost forgot. If you're not familiar with the Oliver viewer from MassDot, it's wonderful. Um, I'll remove all the highway stuff. You know. Pull up. Something you want to see, like trains, meter rail, active and proposed, one of my favorites, <laughs> and active and proposed, and here you have a browsable view, even to the extent where it shows the proposed Fall River New Bedford line in the dashes. And one of the greatest things about this is, click, pull up their data export wizard, select what layers you want, it'll validate them, and here's my favorite, Google Earth, bam. This is how I display all of the root information, the purple, uh, that's how I'm displaying from a, a, a KML layer, all of the T icons and the purple lines are a KML layer on the Google Maps JavaScript <coughs> API, thanks to Oliver. You don't have to update that every 12 seconds. <laughs> no. no, but I'm a little behind actually. Really well. <laughs> they, they've actually, uh, I, I, I don't have the, um, the proposed lines. Um, I do have the, um, the down easter. Oh, the, in the summertime, the down easter, I'd say about 80% of the time will report and it's, it's fun to be able to watch the train going all the way to Hyannis on a Friday afternoon, a Friday evening. That's the Cape Cod. Yeah, the Cape Cod. Yeah, Cape. Did I say it wrong? Yeah, Cape Flyer. Yeah, Cape Cod. Um, again, kudos to them. Realtime.mbta.com is also the mass. If you just do a search for mass dot developers Google group, you'll find the whole discussion board. You can ask questions. Astounding. I've 
had conversations with the CTO of MassDOT and MBTA, and, I, and, I, and people I, I run into at the agency now, because I'm on the writer of committee, I tell them the real time effort, besides putting the data out, also the in-station countdowns, I think it's the most effective money that the T has spent ever as far as making an impact on the daily commute that we all have. It's been, it's been wonderful. <laughs> I can stay around as long as anybody else wants to. I'm sorry that I, I went over and I didn't allow time for questions at the end like I wanted. Sorry about that. Yeah, I think we do need to vacate because there's a class that's supposed to be in here at one, so maybe the conversations can move outside into the hallway or wherever. I will pack up and I'll join whoever wants to join me outside.